you doing? Oh, it's okay. You can applaud. Not in order. It's going to confuse everybody. <laughs> Good enough. Good afternoon, everyone. This is our STS-135 post-landing news conference with Atlantis' astronauts. And we'll start with some comments from the crew, and then we'll take questions. So we'll turn it over now to our commander, Chris Furness. Chris? Uh, well, hello. As uh, I think we're elated to be back here in Florida. Um, the weather was perfect today. You know, uh, one of the things we always have in the back of our mind is, uh, is uh, are we going to end up back in Florida? Are we going to end up in California? Um, Mike Leinbach, the launch director before we launched, said, you may not go to F California. So we had to come back to Florida. Fortunately, the weather cooperated, and uh, we, had a, uh, we had a nice pre-dawn landing. Um, I'll just pass it down the line here real quick. To my left, uh, Sandy Magnus, uh, MS-1. Uh, uh, she was the chief loadmaster. She had to haul all the heavy stuff uh, on and out of the MPLM. She did uh, everything from robotics to taking care of us on the mid-deck. Um, and uh, she was a, just a tremendous asset to this crew, and I'm uh, proud to have called her my crewmate. Sandy? Yeah, the mission uh, was incredibly busy. Uh, we knew it was going to be incredibly busy when we started. We, had a, we got tons of help from the space station crew, and uh, with their help and all the great work that these guys did, we were able to get all of that cargo transferred, and then more cargo transferred back to the MPLM. And, yeah, I just have to say it was such a pleasure to be on the International Space Station again. That that's such a magical, wonderful place. And in some ways I felt like I'd never left, but it's even bigger than it was two years ago. It's just a spectacular place. On my left is Mission Specialist 2 Rex Walheim, and he was our EVA guru and transfer guru as well. You did, he did a lot in the MPLM that you may or may not have seen on the camera, but he was in there every day practically when he wasn't doing EVA stuff. And, and it's been a real fun flying with Rex. We're classmates, and it's been really great sharing this experience with him. Thanks, Sandy. <coughs> and basically for transfer, I did just did what Sandy said to do, and that's pretty much what all we did. And uh, uh, it was a, it was a uh, it was a it was an absolutely great experience. It was uh, tremendously busy, as Sandy said. I think you've heard that before. Um, and I just want to say what an honor it has been to be part of the space shuttle program. I started 26 years ago as a back room for the Max flight controller. And I have loved every minute that I've been part of the space program. It's been such an honor, and uh, it runs in the blood. I think every, you, you know here when you talk to people here at the Kennedy Space Center, at the Johnson Space Center, that it just runs in the blood. And uh, uh, it's just everybody just wants to be a part of it, and uh, we understand it's time to transition, but uh, we're going to cherish every minute of it. Um, it uh, I do want to thank all the folks who on the ground who helped us out here at the Kennedy Space Center to get us off in a very exciting launch. and. To, and to recover us on, uh, on a wonderful landing, and then also the mission control and all the folks at the other space flight centers who helped us during the mission. And uh, on my left is uh, pilot Doug Hurley. Uh, Doug was uh, the, the chief of the great f undocking and fly around you saw. And I'm sure it looked pretty, and you, uh, and you saw pictures of it, but it was uh, pretty challenging inside. And Mr. Marine here was calm as a cucumber as all things were, uh, were lining up and, uh, and as we were all doing a different task. And he was just uh, running the show, and, uh, and he did a great job. So with that, Doug. Thanks, Rex. Uh, I don't know what else to say other than uh, we are glad to be back here in Florida. Uh, it, was a, it felt like about a two-month mission crammed into 13 days. We, we ran from dawn till dusk literally up there. And... Uh, I think we left the station better than we found it, and uh, I think we've got them set up for the for the long haul. And uh, anyway, Fergie never gets introduced, so other than to just say the commander. But you know, he's the guy who kind of he's the glue that kind of kept us together, heading in the same direction uh, for this. I, I think almost surreal from start to finish experience. And uh, y you, I don't think any of you appreciate kind of the demands and kind of the pressures and the emails that only Chris gets that he dealt with and there was absolutely no indication positive or negative uh, to the rest of us and he just you know kept us going in the right direction and you know he's yeah I, you know we can't say enough about Sandy but we also can't say enough about Chris he he just was uh, a great guy to work for and uh, I'd like to do it again with him uh, sooner rather than later. Thanks Doug. 
All right, with that, we'll take questions. Please be sure to give the, your name and affiliation when the microphone comes to you. And we'll start down here in the front with Marsha. Marsha Dunn, Associated Press. We just heard from Mike Leinbach that tears were flowing on the runway when you guys came in. I'd like to know if tears were fl flowing in the cockpit and what were the emotions at touchdown at will stop? I, I, well, I think uh, what I'd say is we each got choked up at different times in the mission. There were, it, it's, it's funny because there are certain times where you have to do nothing but concentrate and you can't feel the historic nature of it. Like, for instance, when, when Doug was doing the undocking, I mean, it was a magnificent sight. It was, it was dark. And, uh, and we were departing, and I, just, I was a little bit f set back so I could be a little bit more detached for the first part. And when the station crew said that Atlantis is departing, it just, that was one that really choked me up. And I know there are other parts that really choked people up too, and it's just, uh, it kind of depended on what part of the mission you were at and what your job was. But there were times th that you would just take the big picture and it would, it would get to you. Peter? Good afternoon, Peter King with CBS News Radio, and thanks for answering the same hundreds of questions <laughs> hundreds of times. Instead of looking back, I want you to look ahead because every 10 years or so we interview Gene Cernan on the anniversary of him being the last uh, man to walk on the moon. In 10 years, when you come back as the last shuttle crew for the anniversary, where do you think we will be? Not where you hope we'll be, but where do you think we'll be in terms of uh, the U.S. and human space uh, flight and exploration? Yeah, that's a great question, Peter. It really is. Uh, I know where I hope we'll be. Uh, as to where I think we'll be, um, given everything that, that I know today, I, I think that we'll be, uh, we'll be traversing back and forth a low Earth orbit uh, with uh, one of the four or five uh, vehicles that are being considered right now. I think that that's going to be a, a well-traveled path. I think that we're going to have uh, people uh, spending either short or perhaps long periods of time uh, in orbit who have um, you know, paid for a trip there. Um, you know, I, I don't think it's too much unlike the, the airlines. You recall that the, the whole airline industry, the whole aviation industry got started uh, with, uh, with NACA. Uh, they, they designed aerofoils. They, they enabled uh, aviation to take off. Uh, and NASA, I think, has really laid the foundation for, for space flight and commercial space flight to take off. So I think in 10 years we'll see that. Um, I think we'll be on the verge, if not have uh, already launched uh, a heavy lift vehicle. Uh, NASA's developed and designed heavy lift vehicle with the intent of leaving low Earth orbit. Um, if we're not there, we'll, we'll have been there very shortly. So personally, that's where I think we're going to be. And I don't know, it, it, clearly it's, it's my opinion. Uh, and uh, and I, I hope that it's, it's something that does take place because we do really need something to look forward to. Uh, you know, I know right now is a little bit of a time of mourning, if you will, but, you know, that's, ex that's to be expected. Uh, you know, we've all, we've said that we're, uh, we're saying goodbye to a good friend. Uh, and we'll get over that. And we'll, uh, we'll, we'll once we get over it, uh, we'll, uh, we'll start looking forward and, we'll, and we'll, uh, we'll make it happen again. Okay, right here. Uh, hi, Clara Moskowitz with Space.com. And I'm wondering um, if any or all of you plan to visit the shuttles, especially Atlantis, once they're installed in their museum homes? Yeah, I, I think it would be nice to see them uh, in their museum homes. And it'll be kind of interesting, too, because we'll have a perspective of someone who's lived on the shuttle and operated it. So I think to go and kind of see it through other people's eyes as they've chosen to display it and, and watch people. I think it'd be fun actually to go to a museum and watch people look at the shuttle and sort of listen to the comments that they're making. That I think would be very interesting. It's right here. Hi, <coughs> Kim Spildrur with the Norwegian Space Flight Magazine, Room 4X. Um, before the flight, you spoke of that you didn't think you'd start to, to think um, wouldn't be able to start to sink in, that this is sort of the final flight of the space shuttle. Now you walked around the vehicle, you had a couple of hours to sort of start to be in the ground again. Uh, has that started to sink in that it's, this is it for the space shuttle? Yeah, and I think when it, it, it actually started to sink in sooner than I thought it would. 
uh, it was um, in flight, like I was talking about earlier. Every once in a while, it would it would start to sink in, and it was uh, it was it, like it, mostly in the quiet times. Like the other time was when we were at, we're on the mid deck of the space shuttle, where we kind of live and live in, uh, and sleep. And, and uh, I was down there just thinking about all the other crews that had gone before me, and you're thinking, oh, this is the last time. And uh, uh, someone was asking us whether we would s go to visit the Atlantis in the museum something, and I, s I certainly plan to. I plan to go with my, my kids and, uh, and take them and, and show them when it's on display in a beautiful uh, place here at the Kennedy Space Center and think back that, uh, that we were the last crew that lived on there. And uh, I'm sure uh, Doug can point out my peach apricot stains on the lockers, too, and everything. So, uh. Hi, uh, Eben Brown, Fox News Radio. Um, how did Atlantis perform on her on her final trip? Uh, she went up, came back, she landed, being towed back. Uh, what shape is she in? And uh, if by some magical reason there were another set of SRBs in an external tank and they said, go fly, could she do it? Doug? Yeah, most definitely. Um, everything we asked of her, she gave us. It, uh, other than the... We, we had a, a wake-up call in the middle of the night. Uh, one of the GPCs got a little cranky, but uh, that happens. I, I mean, everything worked just like it was supposed to. And uh, Chris and Rex and I got a little practice with some malfunction procedures to get the GPCs back in order. But that, I mean, that was not a big deal. And it was probably made a, probably a bigger deal down here than it really was up there. Uh, but the funniest thing about that that one, and, and that's the really, frankly, the only thing I can think of that was even, oh, that doesn't work or that doesn't I mean light switch. Everything worked perfectly. Uh, but it was just the, the memory I'll have of that is, you know, the alarm went off. You know, we're all in our sleeping bags. The mid-deck's dark. And Chris and I pop out of our sleeping bags, and we look at each other and go, what was that? <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then, and, and then it we get out of our sleeping bags, we go up to the flight deck, we turn on a display, and we sort out that it was GC GPC-4, and then just, I think Chris described them as gophers coming out of their holes. <laughs> Rex pops up, pops up the ladder, hey, what's going on? And then Sandy, who was sleeping on Space Station, popped up after that, so it was, that is, so that's gonna. What do we say? Will everybody please just go back yeah, to bed? Go we'll back take to care sleep. of this. We got it, we got it. <laughs> but uh, no, Angie Brewer and her team, had Atlantis ready to go, and I guarantee you 60 days from now she could go again. It's right here. Hi, Robert Perlman with CollectSpace.com. Um, Rex's apricot stains notwithstanding, um, did you as a crew leave anything of yourselves uh, on board Atlantis before leaving, perhaps like the final four inscription that you did on the simulators back in Houston? Uh, we we did. We left a little something. We didn't want to make it permanent. We certainly didn't want to we didn't want to deface Atlantis. We wanted to leave it up to up to the the ground processing crew to decide what to do with what we left behind. But we left um, we left an inscription, um, a little plaque, and uh, it, it was basically a tribute to the, the the people who had worked on the space shuttle program since the day one, thanking them for their for their dedication and uh, to uh, uh, you know just let them know how much we thought about the work that they do uh, from the from the astronauts, from the people who get to operate the vehicle that they maintain. You know, a lot of people think the astronauts live here in Florida and we rub elbows with these folks every day, but we don't. We live far away. And it's sometimes it's a, it's a little bit of an effort to get out here and, and give them the thanks and the praise they deserve. And, and we try to go the extra yard. And for the record, I did clean up my peach apricot drink stain. You did. <laughs> <laughs> Mostly. The pilot made them. <laughs> yeah, right here. Brian Locke, uh, Delaware County Times, near Philadelphia. Yeah. Uh, now that the wheels have stopped, uh, when one STS-135 is mentioned, what will be your most memorable moment of that flight, and what would be your most memorable moment of all your flights? Oh, wow. Ah. That's hard. That's a hard one. Uh, well, you know, uh, probably not one you would think. Um, when, the, when the countdown clock stops at 31 seconds and somebody says the clock has stopped due to a malfunction, that tends to that tends to stick with you. Um, <laughs> the first question that comes to mind is, well, what kind of malfunction? <laughs> um, you know, uh, and that's, that's just the pilot's perspective. I think if I had to look at it from, uh, you know, the layman's perspective, you know, the, the, just the image of the space station up there. And, and unfortunately, we cannot convey uh, 
you know, if you've seen pictures, but the pictures just do not capture the majesty of what humans have built in low Earth orbit. I mean, this is just an immense vehicle, and people are just living and working in it like it's Earth, only they float from module to module. It's almost a surreal experience, and uh, that, that's probably my, my most touchy-feely memory. Uh, Frank Moriarty, New Jersey Monthly, to continue the Northeast area. And Chris, uh, the Eagles hat's for you. But the question is for Sandy. Uh, you have more spaceflight time in orbit than, than the rest of the crew. And with the conclusion of this mission in the shuttle program, it seems like the rules of the game are changing, both in terms of the spacecraft that will be used in the years to come, as well as the inception of commercial crew low, low Earth orbit operations contrasting with NASA's plans for uh, deep space exploration. Do you foresee a time when uh, there may be different career paths for astronauts based on low Earth operations versus deep space? Is it getting to a point where that may be a consideration? You have to decide which direction you want to go in? Yeah, I think that's a conceivable idea because as you get more access to low Earth orbit, of course, the, the scope of missions possible uh, increases, and so that would require a whole different type of skill set. So. It's, it becomes, I, I, I hate to say this, but it becomes kind of a less of an exploration and more of a utilization, whereas the deep space missions are more of an exploration flavor and that requires different skill sets. So I think just as when the shuttle came online, you saw an expansion of the types of opportunities available for people. You know, we now needed scientists and, and uh, medical doctors and a, a wider variety of, of skill sets for that. I think you'll see the same thing here during this transition. So every little leap broadens the possibilities for for people to go to space. And we have time for just one final question right here. Mark Ratterman from Talking Space. Uh, on the subject of commitment, question for Doug Hurley. You each uh, individually said yes, you'd be a member of STS-135 crew. What happens from today? What things do you continue to do as a crew? What's happening in the near future for you together? Uh, I think today we're probably going to go out and get a nice meal somewhere and then uh, head back to Houston tomorrow, say hi to the folks back there, and then we start in debriefs on Monday, physicals and debriefs again. We had some medical stuff earlier, so we'll probably be pretty busy. The debrief process usually takes a couple weeks, and then there's some post-flight PR appearances that, that we'll do after that. So we, we've got a few more months, I think, together, which is great because it would be hard to kind of stop it right now. So. Um, I think that's generally what we'll be doing over the next uh, probably couple, three months. Okay, we've got just about a minute. James, if, if you can give us a quick one, we'll come right here to you. Yeah. Uh, James Dean with Florida Today. I had a question for Doug as well. Um, you, you waited a very long time for your first flight. I believe it was like nine years. And um, I just wondered if hopefully it's not that long for the next one. But did that experience give you any kind of perspective, uh, any lessons learned in terms of patience, perseverance that you think um, might help you and the rest of the astronaut corps, uh, anyone else involved with the program to, to kind of deal with what might the gap that's to come? Yeah. Well, I mean, we're still going to fly people. Obviously, the rate's going to be three or four a year rather than 30 or 40. Um, yeah, that for my class, the timing was not very good for flying quickly um, but there were folks in Rex and Sandy's class that waited 10 11 years so it definitely builds some perseverance if, if you didn't have any although frankly most of us didn't get here because we you know didn't have any perseverance but uh, yeah it it definitely you know it's worth the wait but it's you know you, you've got to put the effort in as well but uh, you know, hopefully, uh, if I fly again, I, I, yeah, waiting another nine years to fly again would be would be harder rather than easier. But uh, you know, it, it, the the opportunity to go beyond low Earth orbit or do a six month ex expedition is is a great opportunity as well. And you know, you just put your time in and and do your job well, and you know, y it, good things come. So I think I'll leave it at that. All right. Well, that's all the time that we have with our. Atlantis crew today, so that will conclude this briefing, and we'd like to thank the crew very much for coming. And thank you very much. This concludes the briefing. Thanks. Yeah, thank you.